The point of today's workshop is, we call it the smorgasbord workshop if you actually read my email, because we're just going to be going over some basic gotchas of Unity, stuff that's like, oh, I'm new to this, I don't know how this thing works, and I feel like I should, or even worse, you think you know how it works, and you don't, and something breaks and you have no idea why. So David and I have a couple of little things that we'll probably bring up already. So I threw together a tiny little prototype, something you'll probably need to use a lot of in your game, regardless of what the game is, are collisions, stuff hitting each other, or stuff not hitting each other, but you want to know about it anyway. Uh, super common thing that you'll use a lot, even if you haven't used it yet. So I want to go over a brief little uh, area of confusion when you're new to this. So I've got two cubes here. Uh, they're called top cube and bottom cube, but they're out of order. There we go. That makes more sense. So they're called top cube and bottom cube, and we're just going to go over how you could tell when they're colliding and stuff like that. So has anybody here already seen or done a little bit of research into on collision enter or on trigger enter? Is anybody familiar with those terms? Okay. So if you haven't already, especially since you're just starting your games now, and I'm sure a lot of you guys don't have much experience with Unity yet, uh, totally go to their website. They have awesome tutorials there. Um, here, it's just unity3d.com, and then when you're there, oh, what, the website's, oh, <laughs> untie.com. Gosh, I am, I am an excellent stenographer. Unity3d.com, there we go. I was going to say, their, their layout looks bad. All right, so you go to the Learn tab up at the top, and they've got a whole bunch of stuff. They've got documentation for all of their functions and classes. Well, yeah, for the most part. You'll see some of the newer stuff sometimes is a little bit less well documented, but in general, they've got very good documentation. And you can also hop over to tutorials, and they've got tons of full tutorials for like, hey, you want to make a 2D rogu roguelike? How about take about two hours of your time and learn how to do it? But there's also plenty of smaller ones. It's like, I just need to learn a thing about scripting. So I hop down here and you're like, huh, what's get access? As a side note, that's like an access on a uh, joystick. Or if you create uh, keyboard bindings for axes, it's an input stuff thing. But there's tons of stuff here that's really helpful. So I would definitely look at these in your free time. Um, that being said, back to our little example here. What's up, Dr. Mark? <laughs> what does it say, butt build? Yeah, I do have that extension. Thank you for noticing, and thank you for knowing that. <laughs> Sammy Hansen gave me this extension, and it, it's changed my life. <laughs> yeah, you got to get cloud to butt extension. Changes every occurrence of the text cloud to butt for your, ex for your browser. And sometimes you really don't know which word it's supposed to be when you see the word butt. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so... If there's a collision that happens in your game, like between two lovely, uh, these are called cubes, but since this is Unity 2D, you could just think of them as squares. Secretly, they're actually cubes because I didn't make 2D art, but shh. Anyway, yeah, Unity's cool like that. Like, 2D games are oftentimes 3D games in disguise. That's because Unity was originally just a 3D engine. But we'll, we'll go over that in, in time to come. So. What if I want to tell if these two cubes have just hit each other or overlapped or anything like that? That's what those functions are going to be for. So first things first, these need to have box colliders 2D on them, or box collider 2Ds on them. Um, if you're doing a game in 3D, then they would have just box collider minus the 2D. That's sort of the convention that Unity uses. If you're using the physics system in 3D, it's just named regularly. If you're using the 2D system, pretty much everything will have the letters 2 or the number two and the letter D after the name. Because internally, they're like two totally different systems when you're doing 3D or 2D. They don't play along at all, actually. 2D colliders will not collide with 3D colliders because it's just a two-dimensional uh, plane. So make sure that if you're looking up any documentation, if you're making a 2D game, your rigid body needs to be a rigid body 2D. Your box collider needs to be a box collider 2D. You need to use on trigger enter 2D. Uh, all of that stuff will be followed by a 2D. That's how you know you're doing it right. If things aren't working, I would look towards that. So we got our box collider 2D on this cube and a rigid body 2D on this cube. Um, and let's see. I'm going to uncheck that for now. 
And notice the bottom cube does not have a rigid body, just the top one. And if you don't remember, rigid bodies are what allow objects to interact physically. So if you want it to have gravity, or if you want to be able to have your character punch this cube and see it go flying off into space, it needs to have a rigid body on it. So let's just hit play. And no, oh, it's playing in 3D. Whatever. Wait, actually, wait, I thought. Doesn't it turn your camera all ortho Doesn't it turn it orthographic when you by default do 2D? No. Yeah, where is it? Mm, oh. Mm. Now it's 2D. Excellent. Okay. So I'm just going to give this cube on top a gravity scale of 1 so it gets interacted by gravity. And look at that. Plop on top of the other cube. And you see this little message I sent down here, which you probably can't read. Actually, maybe I should turn off that light. So it's more. I still don't blame you if you can't read it, that's okay. So they collided, and that's super great. But what if you need to know about that collision in code? Like, let's say you have a physical person, and you have a physical enemy. And if they bump into each other, you take damage. So you, your code needs to know that that bump, that collision just happened. So you see this little message down here. Let me explain that. In my code here, we've got a function called onCollisionEnter2D which is a long name, and it needs to be named exactly this. If you're already familiar with some coding, which hopefully everybody is at least a little bit, you'll know that every class can have its own uh, member function or its own member method, and you can name it whatever you want and make it do whatever you want. But something that's really cool about Unity, um, because even though it seems like a very object-oriented programming language, C Sharp, which it is, uh, down underneath in the framework and the nitty-gritty, you got the .NET framework, which lets you do really cool things like sending messages, which is sort of a way of saying, if I have some class that's doing something, and I know I've got this object, and I want this object to do something for me, like let's say, on close and enter 2D, let's say it's got a method called this. Um, if in a different script, I'm like, hey, I want my object to do this thing, but I don't know if he has this thing. So I don't know if my object has a function called onClison enter 2 d It's called sending a message. So Unity does this internally without you having to worry about it at all. Every physics frame, it says, for every object, let me just send it a message, like sending a letter. And that message is called onClison enter 2 d If they have a function called that, I will call that function. If they don't have that, well, I don't care. It's not going to cause an error or anything. So because of that, you need to very specifically name your function this. If it is spelled wrong, like you wrote uh, on collision, which, oh my god, I've done so many times, uh, it will not work. And you won't get an error either, because it's still a function that you've named yourself. So the compiler doesn't know, hey, he screwed up. So if you're having an error, please check to make sure you've spelled it right. It's just the same as like start or update or awake. Any of those built-in functions that you create have to be named very specifically what um, what the documentation says. So those two cubes just collided, and it printed this message saying, cube, my name, on collision 2D enter called. Awesome. So that's super simple. It's actually, at least in my opinion, not nearly as useful as using triggers. So who here has um, seen or knows what I'm saying when I say a trigger in Unity? And I can see hands. OK, so we've got at least a couple. Um, Definitely research into this stuff after the workshop today, because I can guarantee there's almost 0% chance you're not going to need to use triggers when you make your game. So a trigger is just a special kind of collider. So remember that I said this cube has a box collider 2D on it, and so does the other cube. What you can do is there's a little button down here called is trigger, and you can just check that. Oh, and I forgot I was playing, but that actually very accurately demonstrated what I wanted it to do. You notice that when I create this cube and I make it is trigger and press play, it falls through the other one. So basically, it has a collider, but it will not physically interact with things. That is the definition of a trigger. So it's super useful for like, let's say you've got an end of level zone, like in a Sonic game when you beat the level and you cross the finish line and it's like, yeah, you won, generic 90s music, and you're like, yeah, that's awesome. That's because there's a trigger there, which is just an invisible cube or an invisible whatever shape um, that you haven't physically interacted with, but the code now knows that you have touched this area. So it's super useful for that sort of thing to use triggers. So you'll be using them a lot, I would imagine. I know I use them a lot. 
I generally find it more frequently that I use on trigger enter rather than on collision enter, which you can see up here. So it works the same way, almost, as on, uh, on collision enter 2D. The difference being, uh, well, all right, wait, hang on. I, can, I can't zoom in the editor, but I could zoom in this. Sweet. Can everybody read that now? I'll just take that as a yes, because it looks like that's a good size. Um, this function takes an argument for a collision called collision 2D other. You'll see I didn't use it here, but a collision object, if I were to be like other dot, oh, you can't read that, it's all tiny. Well, a collision is a type of object that gives you access to all the information that happened at that exact collision. Like what objects were involved, like what points of the objects touched each other, all of the super interesting information. Um, so that's super cool. Sometimes you'll find it useful, sometimes you won't, but it's great that it's there. It's different, however, for on trigger enter, because if you notice the argument to on trigger enter is not a collision 2D, it's a collider 2D. So what this means is when this function gets called and you want to know, hey, my two cubes just bumped into each other, they just overlapped, you can't get specific information. You could only see what was colliding and the things that were colliding were the collider 2D. So I could be like other dot name here, actually, let's, instead of using this print, we'll put a print over here, other dot name. I don't want to do print because it's easier. And if we do this again, you'll see we got our little thing right there where it wrote down the names of the colliders that were there, or the names of the game objects, rather. Um, so the main reason I brought this up as a, a gotcha, as a thing you guys should know, now that we've explained all the background, is on trigger enter, you could for a moment ignore on collision enter, because on collision enter usually behaves the way you want it to. On trigger enter can sometimes be a bit confusing as to when and why it will work. Because sometimes you'll have a trigger and it'll overlap with another trigger and you'll be like, well, like nothing, it didn't call the function, I don't understand, why? Um, and there's a few reasons for this, but in general, it has to do with whether or not, well, pretty much always, it has to do whether or not one of those objects has a rigid body on it. So you'll see that on trigger enter will only get called whoop, if this is a trigger here. Obviously, if it's you know, not a trigger, it won't get called ever. Um, but let's say both of these objects are triggers. And let's say, like, all right, maybe it's just I don't know, maybe one of these triggers is like my player hurt box, you know, we'll say like the head of my character or whatever, something like that. Um, and this other one is my enemy hit box, we'll say, like the little bubble where you punch that says in this bubble do damage, you know. Let's just pretend that that's what the, these cubes represent. And you're like, oh, well, great, whatever. But will it be able to tell? Okay, so it did print, so it could tell, which is awesome. They didn't interact at all. They both have triggers. Great, we could tell. However, that only happened because the rigid body 2D was on here. If I got rid of the rigid body, um, and granted, it's not going to fall now, so I would have to manually like pretend and be like, well, I'm just going to move it here. You don't get any print because these uh, triggers have overlapped. They have touched, but one of them doesn't have a rigid body. And that's the only way for on trigger enter 2D to know if that trigger has intercepted another trigger is if one of them has a rigid body, which can be confusing, especially when you're a beginner. So that's pretty much it. So like if I unpause this and I'll just put my rigid body back on here, or actually I could even here, I'll put a rigid body on the bottom cube because it was on the top cube last time and I'll turn its gravity scale on zero. If I were then to move it, boop, see I get these messages. You'll also notice, uh, if I didn't already explain this, since it's on trigger enter 2D, this is theoretically only going to be called once the first frame that these two things collide, and then never again until they collide again later. Um, there's also, just so you know, it works the exact same way. There's on trigger exit and on collision exit. There's also on trigger stay which is only if this um, has happened for more than one frame. All of this is sort of the most unreliable version of this collision function. Generally, on trigger enter is the one you'll be using the most. Um, anyway, that aside, you'll notice um, 
Uh, it's just a small little interesting thing that is good to know. Playing around in the scene, like while the game is running, can sometimes give you under, uh, expected results. So like, you see that it's printing this, like every single frame that I'm moving this. I don't know, it's probably hard to see, but if you look at that little number there, those messages are happening every frame that I'm moving this. That would not happen if I wasn't just fiddling around in the scene view, just so you know. So that's just a little aside. Be careful if you're playing around with stuff in the scene view during play, it might change the results you're expecting. Normally on collision or on trigger enter would not be getting called every single frame I'm moving this object through the other one. It's only happening because I'm in the editor right now or I'm doing it in the scene. Like that's sort of cheating. So just be careful of that. That's just another gotcha. Um, I'm going to be talking more about a couple more gotchas that are pretty common in Unity. Um, I guess the first one that's really big um, that Spencer kind of touched on at the very end there is uh, you should be careful and you should avoid directly setting your transform's position when you're doing stuff with Unity, uh, especially if you want it to be driven by the collision system. Um, and that's because if you set your position directly, uh, the collision system will say, hey, well, if I'm here now, then I must have gotten some giant force applied to me that moved me there. Um, or it'll just completely mess up and avoid doing a bunch of stuff. Um, so basically, it's just a really simple tip. Um, if you're using uh, rigid bodies uh, on your objects, don't directly set their position. Uh, control their velocity or control it by adding forces, but don't directly set its position. Can you show us what in code you mean by setting the position directly? Of course. So let's say that we've got our my cube here. So what I mean by directly setting their position is if we have a void update in here, uh, if every frame of the update I say something like uh, transform dot position equals time dot there should be I'm looking for like the total time there we go time dot time times 0 0.1 this is in seconds right yeah yeah and then we'll just make this a vector free Why is he yelling at me? Right. So all that this is doing here is saying uh, every frame just update my position by setting its x value to the total number of seconds elapsed uh, times one tenth and put it at y equals zero and z equals zero. So uh, we've still got our on trigger enter and on collision enter and stuff, but let's go ahead and run this now. So you can sort of see we got one there. Oh, do we have one on both of them? Uh, it is on both, but one of okay. them is on Where is this one? Let's move this to zero, zero, zero. And we'll just let this one start it. Oh, wait, my cube is on both. We have to delete the component. Right. Let's get rid of it on this one. So theoretically, this one should be detecting whether or not you've run into something. Let's, uh, let's color this a different color real quick so we can make it sort of easy to see the difference between them. Uh, just like in our last tutorial, you can just do that pretty easily by making a new material, we'll call it like red, and we'll pick our typical artsy red and put that on something. Uh, and we go ahead and run this. Uh, we did get one notice there but <laughs> the reason why we got that notice is because the collision system directly moved it into the other cube. Um, uh, if we do this a lot, we can get some unreliable results when using rigid bodies, um, especially when you like do stuff with setting your velocity. So let's move our rigid body onto the top cube. Okay, we'll set that gravity scale. Well, we can set the gravity scale to one. So this is obviously gonna keep us at the same height as we were last time because we're directly setting the position. But now if we want to have some extra velocity stuff. So let's say 
we, we're setting our position manually over time, uh, and we want stuff to collide with it. Uh, we've got a rigid body on here. Let's put a rigid body on here, too, and turn off its trigger and see what happens. So you can sort of see that they're not really colliding. Well, it's because that's the second is the trigger. Let's turn this gravity to zero. So that was a pretty awkward result right there. Um, and the reason why that's happening is because we moved it all the way into our cube, uh, which made the collision system say, hey, we must be interpenetrating. And if we look at where our cube is now, it got ejected out the left side really, really hard. Um, uh, and this, especially when you're moving up against stuff, so let's like, move this cube over here and let them run into each other again. So that will happen. And obviously, our cube is moving really, really slowly. Um, so we didn't expect it to jettison the other cube uh, out to the right incredibly fast. So we'll play that one more time to sort of see what happens. But it looks like our cube is moving really, really slowly. But a gentle push. yeah, but we bump into it. And this time, we're actually just going into the other cube. Um, and this is because, like I said earlier, um, we're messing with the, with the physics system. And oh, then our cube jettisons out to, uh, through the bottom of the screen. Yeah, um, those are both solid, so that should never have happened. Yeah. Um, and to us, it looks like, wow, the cube's moving really, really slowly. And then it just sort of wanders into this other cube. And then all of a sudden, it gets shot out the bottom. Um, and the reason for that is because we are setting our position directly. Um, the way that most collision systems work is uh, they go each frame and they say, hey, are these two objects interpenetrating each other? Uh, and expects them to be like maybe a little bit at worst. And it says, OK, I'll correct this. We just got to move these back apart and add a little force that said we move this back out. Um, but when you set your position directly, you can go from right next to an object to interpenetrating a pretty large distance. And it'll say, hey, I should fix this. It'll move them back out and say, this was a really big distance. I better apply a really big force, because the only way it could have interpenetrated that much is if it was moving really quickly. So the physics system freaks out and shoots it out the side. So the better way to do this is to do something along these lines. Instead of directly setting our position every frame, we're going to control our velocity. And this isn't like the best best practice, because we're doing it in update instead of fixed update. But it'll be good enough for now. So instead, we'll just grab rigid body 2D. I can do what I want. Uh, and we'll just set the velocity instead. No, it's great. I'll show you another cool trick. This is actually one of my favorite things to do uh, because Git component does take time, uh, a little bit of time, albeit, but not uh, an unreasonably short amount of time, um, especially with things like transform. Uh, transform is actually a property on model behaviors. Every time that you say transform dot, it's really secretly calling get component transform behind the scenes. And that can be pretty slow. It does that so that if you remove a transform component and put on another one, you still get that new one that you put on, um, even though you can't do that with transforms. Um, I think transforms just get a firm reference. I don't think they all get every frame. Just for transforms. Yeah. For a lot of other components, it will definitely do it. Transforms, maybe not. But uh, a really easy way to get that same functionality but still get the performance benefits is by doing something like this. We'll say, we'll say this is Richard body. Got to type it. And then in our awake function, we can just say, just like that. So now, even though we previously had a rigid body keyword, rigid body 2D keyword, that was getting our component every single frame, because we have this new in front of it, it says, whenever I say rigid body 2D, I mean this rigid body 2D, not the one from mono behavior. So then we can just replace all of our instances where we would have used rigid body 2D with just that, and it'll work fine. So we can set our velocity this time to, uh, let me 
going to have to estimate what our velocity should be. We'll just say 0.1. Something like that. Switch back to Unity. Probably, oh yeah, there's no Z in vector 2. Silly me. Oh, okay. So we don't need the new keyword here because apparently it doesn't have it Unity as a property. Got rid of all of those yeah. Shortcuts. This was more of a Unity 4 thing, so we so can just say that. Just said minus the new because it's still a good practice. Yeah. Um, so let's just go ahead and run this again. Do we have gravity on it or something? No, I just didn't, didn't you just make it one and one? Oh, right. Got to move it next to it. But uh, it should be oops, one and zero. I think I still have gravity on it, which we ignored because we were setting its position directly last time. But here, when our cubes collide, they'll actually run into each other. It's like Apollo 13 music. Hey. And now it's pushing the second one more like we would expect. Uh, because we're actually setting its velocity instead of setting its position. So that's the big thing with physics systems. Like, respect the physics system. Set velocities or add forces. Don't directly set positions. Yeah, to reiterate what David said, you can set positions manually, but the, you never should. Uh, you, you never should unless you're talking about like a static object. Like maybe you're just, for some reason, you really need to hard code like my mountain in the background which the player can never touch, needs to move over for some reason. That's OK. That's the only time that it's OK to do that. Characters should never be moved that way. Animation should never be moved that way. Would it be fine to do it with the camera? Yeah. So this is mostly mm -hmm. saying physics things don't yeah. set their position. Uh, things that don't use physics, things that don't have colliders on them, or don't use rigid bodies, those are fine to directly set their position of. But everything yeah. with the physics system, you sort of have to play its game. Yeah. The same thing would be said if you wanted to like, move a finish line that was a trigger. That's OK, too. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that's also, sometimes it can be encouraged with triggers, sometimes, because if triggers have rigid bodies on them, occasionally they might not do what you want them to. Like, I remember when I did my first game in Unity, there was like a little sort of, um, like, it was a sphere, an invisible sphere in front of the player that I put there so if, if it would overlap with something, it would give you a prompt, like, do you want to upgrade this? It was a first-person tower defense game. And it would be like, do you want to upgrade this? Because this little trigger in front of me is overlapping with this thing. But it, to get that to work properly, um, the trigger had a rigid body on it so that it could detect that. I'm like, OK, you know, whatever. Uh, the rigid body wasn't kinematic. So sometimes the player would get hit, and then their hit bubble thing would just move around them. <laughs> but it was invisible, so I didn't see. And forever, I was like, well, I want this work. Um, so yes, yeah, sometimes. It might be encouraged. Actually, that would be a bad time. It wouldn't be encouraged in that instance, but just as an example. So real oh. quickly, any questions before we move on? Cool. One thing just to add, um, if you use transform.translate, that's exactly the same as this comp that I was on, uh, line. Like transform.translate is just a shortcut for saying transform.position equals new vector. So don't, don't be fooled. That's also not good. Yep. Uh, cool. So I'll talk about something else real quick. Um, so as a lot of you probably who've tried with you, who've uh, done stuff with Unity are pretty f uh, familiar with, uh, you can make some really easy to inspect variables just by making them public. So if we make public float speed here, then we can just say that we're going to move it by its speed, set its velocity to speed. Uh, then our cube script will get this public variable speed. We can set this to pretty much anything. We can also play with it at runtime, make it faster, make it slower, make it, yeah. So we can play with this pretty easily. Um, but there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that uh, you won't really need to think about until it hits you real hard. Um, and most of this stuff has to do with serialization. Um, serialization is a technique in uh, computer science where we just take an object which has a bunch of data associated with it, we turn it into some concrete number of bits and bytes, and that's called the serialized form. Um, and going from our object in memory to this serialized form is serialization. Um, and then later on, we can recreate that object by deserializing our bits and bytes that we boiled it down to 
it back into an object form. Um, so really cool stuff with Unity is like, as soon as we go into play mode, we can change all these variables on the side here. Um, but as soon as we go back out, they'll reset to their default values. Um, what Unity is actually doing behind the scenes is when you enter play mode, it serializes everything in your scene into a bunch of bits and bytes and remembers what they were. And then while it's running, uh, you can modify those as much as you want. But as soon as you hit play again, it deserializes everything and turns it back into objects. So that's why you can add components, remove components, change a bunch of variables, even delete objects. And when you hit that play button, you'll go back to the way that you were originally. Um, this works most of the time. But an important thing to note is that there are some things that do not serialize with Unity. Um, very specifically, this post sharp, why Unity? So let's do before serialize, and it'll give us a list or it won't give us a list. All right, I'll just look up the... So pretty famously, uh, dictionaries do not serialize with Unity. But here's a list of all the serializable types in Unity. And this will cover pretty much everything that you want to put on an object, except dictionaries. So. Here we go. All classes that inherit from Unity Engine like game objects, uh, components, mono behaviors, textures, animation clips, uh, mono behaviors are in this list, so we're mostly good for those. Um, those will try to serialize themselves. Um, all basic data types, ink, strings, floats, bools, uh, a bunch of built in types like your vectors, quaternions, matrices, uh, colors, rects, layer masks. Um, those will all serialize arrays, lists, enums, and structs. Um, something really noticeable missing from this list is, like I mentioned earlier, dictionaries. Um, so if you're familiar with Python or another programming language that uses uh, dictionaries or objects, uh, like JavaScript has objects, uh, you might be familiar with dictionaries as a, oh right, we need to include So this is just the generic C-sharp stuff. You'll use this a lot. So let's make a dictionary from, let's say, string to integer. And we'll just call this, I don't know, let's do string to string. We'll call it dialogue. Uh, so maybe our cube is in charge of popping up some dialogue on, on screen or something. And we want to be able to say, say this line of dialogue, but we want to be able to change what it actually says and not have to always refer to it. So we'll use like a key for referring to that dialogue and some really long string that we want to say with it. Um, so here we might say, yeah, this is going to work great because we have this dictionary and we have our key for it and what we're actually going to say, yeah, let's go edit it in Unity. And then we got to get rid of speed because we got rid of it. Just get rid of this whole line. So, and then we get really disappointed because it doesn't show up in the inspector. And the whole reason for that is that dictionaries don't serialize. Um, so, we're really disappointed now. We're like, how could this be so terrible with Unity? Dictionaries are super basic, and I'm totally with you. There are some dumb computer science reasons for it. Um, but some cool stuff that we can do to get around this is, I pulled it up earlier, but there's this new thing in Unity 5 called this iSerialization Callback Receiver. Oh. And this is, a, this is really a mouthful, but to break it down to what it actually means, this i in front of uh, the name of it just means that it's an interface, which is just some, a couple functions that we have to promise to implement. And then serialization callback receiver just means that whenever serialization happens, we want to do stuff before it, uh, de before it serializes and after it deserializes. So this gives us those two functions, on before serialize and on after deserialize, that we can use to actually serialize our dictionary. So we'll add this iSerialization callback receiver to our MyCube. 
Now we probably don't want this dictionary public anymore, so we'll make it private. In addition to this, we'll have to add an extra flag uh, to it. And I believe that it's serialized field. Uh, we'll be fine, though, because we're, it doesn't serialize it anyway. Um, so we'll make our list here of string that is our keys. and our values. Well, before these, we'll have to add this serialized field, uh, purely because uh, by default, Unity does not serialize private variables. It will only serialize public variables. Um, that's something to keep in mind while you're developing. Um, if it doesn't show up in the inspector, most of the time, it's because it won't get saved when Unity goes into and out of play mode or does any sort of serialization. So we've got our keys here and our values here. And our goal is before we go to serialize our object, we should take our dialog dictionary, put all of the keys into our keys variable, and put all the values into our values variable. And since Unity knows how to serialize both of these, we'll end up with both of these getting serialized and deserialized properly. Um, and then after we deserialize, we want to put all the key value pairs back into dialog and get rid of whatever's in keys and values. So down here, we can just add, we'll just add it right after this. We'll just add an on before serialize, and we'll say for key value pair string pair in dialog. We'll just say keys.add pair.key and values.add pair.value. So this will just put our keys and values in there. And then after this, we can just say dialog equals null and get rid of our dictionary. Before this, just to be safe, we'll say keys equal new list string and values equals new list string. All right, so our precondition is keys and values can be empty, uh, but dialog has to have a bunch of pairs. I think it's that. Is it that one? What? Oh, right, right, right. What am I thinking? I've been using hack stuff. Yeah. So, sorry, that's for each instead of for been used in some other programming languages that don't do that. So uh, our precondition, keys and values can be whatever. We're going to blow them away and make them new lists. Uh, dialog is full of our pairs. And our post condition is keys has our keys, values has our values, and dialog is blown away. It's got nothing in it. Uh, and so then when we do our on after deserialize, we just want to do the opposite, have our precondition be that keys and values are full of our keys and values, and dialog is whatever. And our post condition is that keys and values are empty, and dialog has all of our pairs in it. So here we can just do, we should probably do a four. Loop over our number of keys and pairs, and we'll just say dialog dot add keys values. We'll set up our dialog before this. And then after this, we'll get rid of our keys. So this is all that we have to do, which is admittedly a lot of busy work to make sure that our dialog gets serialized correctly. Um, but for this, let's just have it so our start function will say we'll just have it print out all of our key value pairs. So on start, we'll just have it print all these out. 
Uh, for awake, I guess we can just fill it up. We could we could trigger it on the enter. Yeah, we'll just push back a couple things. So this is going to be this is going to be pretty ugly. But basically, when it collides with stuff, it's going to add things to its dictionary. Probably should be doing this in editor, but we'll deal. Knocked over my mouse. Um, Where's my mouse? There it is. Probably shouldn't put it in there, actually. I'm not sure where we should put it. I think we'd have to do editor stuff to really get at the core of this, but we'll roll with it. So our dialogue should be serializing properly um, rather than getting blown away and being really nasty. Uh, let's add a little print here so we can see when it's serializing. And we'll probably end up seeing that a lot of this stuff happens in the editor. Not public. There we go. All right, so I messed up and I must have missed something. Let's see, 19. Oh, you don't have line numbers turned on? I don't know my machine, dude. Uh, where's my line numbers? I don't know, dude. I'm going to have to guess which line is line 19 now. Uh, dude, I'll tell you the bottom right. Yeah, I'm looking. 18, 19. OK, what's it yelling at me for? Sorry, this is so off the cuff. Oh, right. So initially, our dialogue could be empty, like right now. Um, we expected it to get set up in like a week or something. But here, we'll have to say if dialogue equals null, then we'll just make it empty. We could actually set it up with a couple lines of dialogue. So let's push back a few. We'll say like that. And let's also have it print out what our stuff is in here. All right, so you see that we get this pretty much constant stream of serializing. This is because Unity serializes your entire scene uh, really, really often. Um, I'm not completely sure why it does that and doesn't do it trigger-based, but that's how it does do it. So let's quickly enter and exit play mode, and we'll hopefully be able to catch a deserializing. Yep, so there's our deserializing call, and we got this stir hello, hello world. Uh, from both of those. So this is our deserialize getting called right here. And uh, we can see that we do have these two strings that we put in because our on before serialize is getting called constantly. So when we exit play mode, uh, all we do is just deserialize our stuff again right here. Um, you can see we sort of got two calls of this now. Um, and our number of calls that we've got from serializing is still going up. So we de deserialized once going into play mode and once coming back out of play mode. Um, so we do have a working dictionary now. Um, but just to show what would happen if we didn't serialize it. Sorry, I'm going. Uh, let's just take out this I serialization call back receiver. Yeah, and then it'll print out all our key value pairs. So our dictionary is not even set up. So that's basically stuff that does and doesn't serialize with Unity. Um, if you're going to be doing stuff with editors, you'll need to know this stuff a lot. 
Um, if your game wants to be using like a basic tile map, which is I think one thing that we wanted to aim at doing for a later tutorial, uh, making your own tile map editor with Unity's editor extensions, uh, you'll need to pay attention to what does and doesn't serialize um, a lot. But it's important to keep this sort of stuff in mind. You won't run into it most of the time, but if you do run into it, it can be some really difficult stuff to debug.